Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost, one God. Amen. I do not intend to focus on the anti-Christian arguments of those writers and TV personalities who have been called the new atheists in this lecture on evidence for God, but it is worth repeating the obvious criticisms which some of the great Christian apologists have made. The God that these new atheists have set themselves up to deny, and the Christian faith that they have set out to condemn, is very often not a God or a faith that any of us would recognise as our own. There is no reason at all for those with faith in God to have to accept the parody of God which is presented as if it were the reality. This is just using a straw man to argue against. In this lecture in which we will consider some of the evidences for the existence of God, we would do well to begin with the insistence of some of these atheists that we prove the existence of God scientifically. We will look at this in more detail shortly, but for now it is enough to say that what is usually meant is that we must show that God is liable to the same sort of physical investigation as all other aspects of the universe. But such a view is already mistaken since Christians are not professing any sort of faith in a material deity who is part of the universe, and therefore we do not need to submit to any sort of materialistic criteria. We do not find God himself at the end of a telescope, nor through the lens of a microscope. The Christian God is not a scientific fact because we believe and confess that God is outside of space and time the creator of the universe, and therefore the creator of science itself. Now this does not mean that we cannot consider the evidence that we believe reveals the existence of God to us, but it is not the sort of direct and comprehensive proof which would make God a fact of science. Rather, it is the evidence which science leads us to conclude points to the transcendental reality of God, beyond the direct observation of science. If we take the example of a television set, for instance, we could dismantle it and discover that it was made of many different components, some of great complexity and ingenuity, and that they all work together in a systematic manner so that an electrical signal received through an aerial or a cable was converted into a colourful moving picture with sound. We would understand that the mechanism of the television set had been constructed by a human mind with intelligence and purpose. But we would not insist that the hidden inside our television were the engineer himself. We would not say that unless we saw the engineer inside his own mechanism, we could not believe that it had been constructed and devised. On the contrary, we would understand from countless such experiences day by day that the expression of intelligent design and purpose presupposed a designer, but did not require the designer, the engineer, the manufacturer to actually be part of what had been constructed. This is no more than the Christian faith insists in regard to the created world. It may well be disputed whether there is a God or not, and whether he created the world or not, but it is not unreasonable at all for Christians to insist that the intelligent and purposeful maker of this universe is not a part of it, and therefore is not liable to scientific study as if he were merely a component of it. Nevertheless, it is also entirely reasonable to expect that science, the study of that which is found in the universe, might also allow us to find evidences for the existence of such an intelligent and purposeful maker of the universe. Over the course of the last century, it might well have appeared that science and faith were mutually exclusive, and that no properly qualified scientist could ever hold as a matter of faith that there was a divine being who had created the universe in some manner known only to himself. But in fact such a view of science as being the domain of the atheist is not very scientific at all. 
and the developments of scientific research in the most recent decades are exposing this fact quite clearly. One of the great atheistic philosophers of our time, Anthony Flew, had committed the greater part of his life to criticising and writing against any possibility of there being a divine being who had made the universe. When he began to think and write, it did indeed seem that science required an atheistic world view. But as scientists have been enabled to look more and more closely, both at the vastness of the cosmos and the infinitesimal details of each atom, Antony Flew found himself beginning to wonder whether atheism was really the best response to the universe being discovered. Indeed, in his book, There is a God, in which he describes why he has become a deist, that is, a person who believes that there is some divine being who has created the universe, he insists that from an early age he had adopted certain principles which always guided his studies, and which eventually in his old age and after a lifetime of atheism led him to conclude that he had been wrong. What was the principle that he adopted at the beginning of his studies? It was that he was committed to following the evidence wherever it led. Now if we have this principle in mind, as the proper basis for scientific inquiry, we can see clearly that science is neither of necessity atheistic nor theistic. Indeed, for much of the field of science, it is rather irrelevant whether the scientist is an atheist or has some faith in some sort of divine being. If I am measuring the electrical current through a circuit, it will not particularly affect my observations if I believe that God created the universe in some way or other, or if I believe that there is no God at all. But if I am a scientist who is considering the origins of the universe, or if my studies are focused on the very origins of life, then it is the case that having decided already that there is no possibility that there could be a divine being, would not be following the evidence where it leads, and would affect the science being conducted in a negative manner. If someone with a Christian faith simply refused to acknowledge any of the evidence that pointed to the universe having been less expansive in the past, and just insisted that the scientific facts must be wrong, because they believed that faith in God demanded a universe of a constant size, then we would say that they were not engaged in science. But equally, someone considering the evidence for the origin of life, having already dismissed any possibility of a creating intelligence, would also not be doing science, and would also be fitting the evidence to their own presuppositions. Science does not require atheism, but it does require an open-minded investigation of the evidence, and a growing number of the most acclaimed scientists and philosophers are willing to state that they believe the evidence points to the existence of some divine being not necessarily the Christian God, which is taught by orthodoxy, but a divine being who has intelligence, almighty power, the creator, one who has provided evidence of his existence in the very material of the universe. I have already mentioned Antony Flew as a leading atheistic philosopher who became a convinced deist before he died a couple of years ago. He says, I now believe that the universe was brought into existence by an infinite intelligence. I believe that this universe's intricate laws manifest what scientists have called the mind of God. I believe that life and reproduction originate in a divine source. Why do I believe this, given that I expounded and defended atheism for more than half a century? The short answer is this. This is the world picture as I see it that has emerged from modern science. Science spotlights three dimensions of nature that point to God. The first is the fact that nature obeys laws. 
The second is the dimension of life and of intelligently organized and purpose-driven beings which arose from matter. And the third is the very existence of nature itself. When I finally came to recognize the existence of a God, he says, it was not a paradigm shift because my paradigm remains as Plato in his Republic scripted his Socrates to insist, we must follow the argument where it leads. Antony Flew is not the only significant figure to have followed the argument and the evidence where it leads. And we will consider some of this evidence in a moment. Many of these other senior scientists have confidently, confidently expressed a deistic or theistic faith. That is, they believe in a God of some sort who may or may not be involved in our personal lives. Professor John Lennox is one of the most well known since he writes and lectures extensively on this subject. He is professor in mathematics at Oxford University and fellow in mathematics and the philosophy of science at Green Templeton College. He clearly expresses the view that the real controversy of our time is not between science and faith, but between the belief that there is only the material world and the belief that beyond this material world there is a God of some sort. These are clearly both beliefs, and they both are expressions of faith. The Harvard geneticist Richard Lewontin insists that his belief in materialism directs his scientific inquiries and is not a result of them. He writes, it is not that the methods and institutions of science somehow compel us to accept a material explanation of the phenomenal world, but on the contrary that we are forced by our a priori adherence to material causes to create an apparatus of investigation and a set of concepts that produce material explanations. So it is entirely possible for scientists to be atheists not because science has convinced them there is no God, but because even before they had put on their lab coats, they had decided that the existence of God was absolutely impossible. Ironically, this places them in the same position as those churchmen who refused to consider that the earth and other planets revolved around the sun. Their prior commitment to a particular opinion prevents them from considering other possibilities. In dedicating one of his books, Richard Dawkins quotes Douglas Adams, who says, Isn't it enough to see that a garden is beautiful without having to believe that there are fairies at the bottom of it? But this is a poor argument, since it offers only false alternatives. Most people would not expect to find fairies at the bottom of the garden. But most people would also reasonably conclude that if there was a beautiful garden, then it was likely that there was a skilled gardener. Christians and other people of faith consider the universe and the world around us and find it no less beautiful than any garden. It is reasonable to ask the question if there is a gardener who has produced and designed such beauty it is reasonable to consider various evidence and conclude that as far as present knowledge permits, it would seem there is no God. But it is neither reasonable nor scientific to insist before all investigation that the possibility of the existence of God must be ruled out. Some of the other highly respected scientists who believe that the evidence of science points to the existence of God include Francis Collins, the director of the National Human Genome Research Institute, and a significant figure in the sequencing of the human genome, or genetic blueprint. He could hardly be a more serious scientist, working on projects of the greatest importance. And yet, having been an atheist for much of his life, he became a committed Christian, having considered the evidence. Others include Sir John Houghton, Fellow of the Royal Society, who has been a co-chair of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change Scientific Assessment Working Committee, 
and was the lead editor of the first three reports on climate change. He has been Professor of Physics at Oxford University and the Chief Executive of the Met Office, the UK's National Weather Forecaster. He says this, The remarkable order, consistency, reliability and fascinating complexity found in the scientific description of the universe are reflections of the order, consistency, reliability and complexity of God's activity. The former director of Kew Gardens in the UK, the National Botanical Research Centre, Sir Gillian Prance, Fellow of the Royal Society, also says, For many years I have believed that God is the great designer behind all nature. All my studies in science since then have confirmed my faith. But we could also consider Sir Brian Heap, former Vice President of the Royal Society, Professor of Geology Bob White at Cambridge University, Professor of Paleobiology Simon Conway Morris at Cambridge University, Professor of Evolutionary Biology Sam Berry at London University, and Dennis Alexander, Director of the Faraday Institute at Cambridge. All of these are highly respected scientists, but they also have a belief in the existence of a God beyond and outside the universe which he has created. Indeed, each of these named here believe that evolution can explain the development of life on Earth. They have much in common with many atheistic scientists in the same fields. But these respected scientists believe that the evidence science provides points to the existence of God. If we turn to some of the evidences which have convinced these scientists that there must be a God, we should perhaps begin with the very existence of the universe itself. There is no obvious reason why the universe exists. For the ancient Greeks, such as Aristotle, it was eternal and had always existed. For Plato, it had been constructed out of pre-existent matter. It was only the Jewish tradition which taught that the universe had a definite creative beginning and that the creator was God. Scientific evidence over the last century has led to the development of a general consensus that the universe had a beginning. And this moment of beginning is often called the Big Bang. Nevertheless, even in the 20th century, there were scientists who proposed theories of a steady state universe that was always in existence and would always be so. The motivation for such theories was often found in a fear that if the universe was shown to have a beginning, then it would be necessary to ask who or what was responsible for it. But that the universe had a beginning is exactly what Christians believe. And science seems to have come to the conclusion, whether scientists accept it or not, that the first words of Genesis are true. In the beginning. If there was a beginning, then it is entirely reasonable to ask what was before the beginning, and what caused the beginning. And it is not within the bounds of science to speculate about such matters. It becomes a matter of considering whose proposals fit the evidence best and which opinions most simply answer the issue being faced. The scientist and Nobel Prize winner Charles Townes writes, In my view, the question of origin seems to be left unanswered if we explore it from a scientific point of view. Thus, I believe there is a need for some religious or metaphysical explanation. I believe in the concept of God and in his existence. Nevertheless, this view has not prevented other scientists proposing two means for the beginning of the universe without God. One is that the universe arose from fluctuations in the quantum vacuum, essentially an emptiness where the unpredictability of behaviour of the tiniest particles might lead to the existence of the universe. But this cannot answer the question, why did a quantum vacuum exist? It just pushes the question of origins back one stage further. Another proposal is that the universe is subject to expansions and compressions and that the Big Bang was the result of the universe 
having compressed to an infinitesimal degree in some previous cycle. But again, this says nothing about why an expanding and compressing universe should exist. And it just pushes the question of the origin of the universe, of that which exists, back a stage or two. So it would seem that we have a scientific question. Why and how did the universe come into existence? And science is unable to provide an answer. It requires more of science than it can properly provide. That the universe exists and had a beginning is already consistent with the Christian faith. Indeed, if we say that Christianity requires that the universe exists and had a beginning, then we find that science supports this view. But the very nature of the cosmos also seems to allow us to consider that it has a creator with a purpose. It might have seemed that science was reducing the importance of life on Earth. We have been shown to be a rather fragile community on a small planet, orbiting an unimportant star on the edge of an average galaxy among millions of other galaxies. This might lead us to conclude that atheist scientists are right. There is nothing special about life at all, and certainly not about human life on Earth. Far from being evidence of a wonderful design, in fact they would say we are of no importance at all. Yet recent scientific advances in cosmology and physics suggest that the universe is finely tuned to support life on Earth, and that this fine tuning requires an explanation. Fred Hoyle, the famous mathematician and astronomer, considered his atheism shaken by the very exact relationships between natural forces and processes. He said, It looked as if a super intellect has monkeyed with physics as well as with chemistry and biology. Theoretical physicist Paul Davis has calculated that if the ratio of certain atomic forces had been different by one part in 10 to the power of 16, that is 10 with 16 noughts after it, then no stars could have formed. If other forces had been increased by one part in 10 to the power of 40, then only small stars could exist. And if it had been reduced, then only large stars would exist. Both are necessary for the development of the universe and for life as we know it. He has also pointed out that at the very instance of the beginning of the universe, if there had been the smallest difference in certain forces, then the universe would either have expanded too quickly to form any galaxies, or expanded too slowly and would have contracted back upon itself. Indeed, Sir Roger Penrose, a leading mathematical physicist, has shown that the odds of creating a universe that turns out the way our one does is one part in 10 to the power 123, a number so vast that there are not even enough particles in the universe to count as high. But there is not only a high degree of fine-tuning visible at the cosmological scale. Even in our own solar system, we find such conditions which are alone suitable for life. If our planet were just 2% closer to the sun, then the temperature would be too hot and all the water would have evaporated. Just 2% further from the sun and temperatures would be too cold to support any life. If the Earth rotated more quickly around its axis, then wind speeds would be like a constant hurricane. And if it rotated more slowly, then the temperature differences between day and night would be too extreme. Even the fact that the size and distance of the Moon from the Earth allows for the observation of a perfect eclipse requires very exact fine-tuning. Now, of course, the facts that the basic forces of the universe are established in such a way that our universe can exist at all in the manner that it does, and that our own Earth is placed in just such a position that it can sustain life, are not proofs of God's existence. Arno Penzias, the Nobel Prize-winning physicist, says, Astronomy leads us to a unique event, a universe which was created out of nothing, one with the delicate balance needed to provide exactly the right conditions required to permit life, 
and one which has an underlying, one might even say supernatural plan. Those scientists who do not wish to consider even the possibility of a god have to respond to this fact that a very precise set of circumstances, each a very small possibility, have come together to allow us to exist in this universe. Some will say that we should not be surprised by the fact of our existence, even with such infinitesimally small chances, because if this universe had not been fortunate enough to arise from nothing, then we would not be here to discover it. But this argument is countered by the philosopher John Leslie, who gives the analogy of a firing squad. If 50 men with loaded rifles all took aim at us and fired, then we would naturally be very surprised if we discovered a moment later that we were unharmed. If someone suggested that we should not be surprised because being alive was the only possible outcome for us to experience, all other outcomes leading to death, then we would find such a view defective. There would be every reason to ask how it was that we had not been killed and were alive to ask the question. It is not different in relation to the existence of the universe and our presence in it. It is entirely reasonable to ask how it is that out of all the possible outcomes which might have led to us not existing, why is it that we do? Saying that we should not be surprised is no response at all. But others have speculated that there must be an almost infinite number of universes and that for this reason, by blind chance, all of those necessary and minute details of the structure of the universe have come together here in this universe, where they have not in all the others. If we think for a moment, we see that this is not really an answer either. In the first place, it is necessary to ask why trillions of universes should exist rather than not exist. How did all of these multiple universes have their origin? And if it is suggested that they all exist in some greater meta-universe, then the question remains, why is there a meta-universe rather than not? How did this meta-universe come into existence? And how does it find itself so well-ordered as our own universe, so that all of the different options for universe construction can be implemented? Arno Penzias points out that those who are not happy with the idea of an unseen creator speculate about things that they haven't seen either. But for those who are open to the idea that there might be a God, the evidence of the fine tuning of the universe points in that direction. The cosmologist Edward Harrison says, here is the cosmological proof of the existence of God. The fine-tuning of the universe provides prima facie evidence of deistic design. Take your choice. Blind chance that requires multitudes of universes or design that requires only one. Now, usually scientists would insist that the simplest solution to a problem is most often the best and most correct. And those who consider this evidence for the unbelievably small chances of our universe being as it is, have often decided that one creative and purposeful God is a better and simpler solution than an infinite number of universes, the origin of which cannot be explained. But it is not only those who look outwards to the stars who have found the existence of God through the investigations of science. There are those who study the biological mechanisms of life on Earth and also believe this leads to a proper and reasonable belief in a creator God. It is undeniable that the world is filled with living forms of such complexity that it looks as though they have been designed. If we took almost any of the structures of almost any living creature and could reproduce it mechanically, then we would be astounded at the skill with which it had been designed. But atheistic biologists wish us to believe that the apparent design in nature is just that, merely something apparent, but which has no reality, because all life and all aspects of life 
have been produced, they would insist, by the operation of processes that contain no design or intelligence whatsoever. Some of these atheistic scientists will state that the forces of nature are blind, and of course in a very real sense they are. We expect that an apple will fall from a tree and land on the ground because of the forces operating on it. We are happy to allow the forces of nature to operate in this way without requiring some special intervention from outside the universe. But it would not be reasonable to assert that because the nature of the forces in the universe leads us to believe that they act according to particular laws, the universe and these laws are not the creation of a divine intelligence. The physicist Sir John Horton explains this saying, The fact that we understand some of the mechanisms of the working of the universe or of living systems does not preclude the existence of a designer any more than the possession of insight into the processes by which a watch has been put together, however imperfectly understood, and however automatic these processes may appear, implies that there can be no watchmaker. It is therefore to be expected that even among those scientists who accept the presence of evolutionary mechanisms in the universe, there will be those who believe that these are the result of an intelligent and purposeful creator and not mere chance. Stephen Jay Gould, an American paleontologist, evolutionary biologist and historian of science said, either half of my colleagues are enormously stupid or else the science of Darwinism is fully compatible with conventional religious beliefs and equally compatible with atheism. And this must be surely so, since evolution only describes a process and cannot have anything to say about how that process may have come into being, nor even how it might be directed. A great many scientists have agreed that evolution as a process does not oppose belief in God. But there are others who do insist that evolution has done away with the need for God altogether. One such is Daniel Dennett, who agrees that the presence of what looks like intelligent design in nature does give some basis for thinking of an intelligent and purposeful creator. But he then goes on to insist that evolution is different because it proposes a mechanism that excludes entirely the need for any external intelligent purpose. He states that evolution is a mechanism whereby entirely random changes in organisms are conserved to future generations of that organism so that beneficial changes build up entirely randomly over very long periods of time without any motive or mind. All life, including human life, is, according to this view, entirely the product of mindless physical processes taking place over billions of years. Now, it is reasonable to ask on what basis such a claim for evolution is made. And this does not require that all use of the term be denied. On the contrary, we can clearly see that changes in animals do take place over even relatively short periods of time, so that we have a wide variety of types of dog, for instance. But what is the basis for stating absolutely that all life has developed from the state of non-life simply by the action of physical processes. Many would say that evolution satisfies more of the known facts than any other hypothesis at present, and so it is on that basis that it is accepted. But Professor DMS Watson is honest when he says, evolution is accepted by zoologists not because it is observed to occur, or can be proved by logically coherent evidence to be true, but because the only alternative, special creation, is clearly incredible. It would seem, therefore, that though many scientists do accept evolution as a process, believing that it could be the means God has used to develop life in the universe, 
Nevertheless, others are unwilling to even accept the possibility of the existence of God, and because of this metaphysical position, are unwilling to allow any criticism of evolution, the means by which they believe God is excluded. The problem is that evolution does not answer all the questions. Robert Wesson, Hoover Institution's senior research fellow, says large evolutionary innovations are not well understood. None has ever been observed and we have no idea whether any may be in progress. There is no good fossil record of any. And Sir Fred Hoyle says, as common sense would suggest, the Darwinian theory is correct in the small, but not in the large. Rabbits come from other slightly different rabbits, not from either a primeval soup or potatoes. Where they come from in the first place is a problem yet to be solved, like much else of a cosmic scale. Now, when we allow what is called microevolution, that is the sort of changes we see in one form of life, to be confused with macroevolution, that is the sort of changes that have not been clearly discovered, but which are assumed to have taken place, to create entirely different types of life, and even to create life itself from non-life, then we are not being fair to the evidence. Science clearly shows that microevolution takes place, and has taken place, but it has not been able to show that macroevolution has taken place, as these two quotations reveal. But since atheistic scientists are dependent on entirely materialistic processes, they must remain faithful to the idea of evolution working the very largest scales and over the longest periods of time, believing that it can still explain the complexity we see in the world around us. Now it is clear that random chance on its own could not even begin to create the structures of living organisms. The eye, for instance, could never arise by chance in a million lifetimes of the universe. But natural selection, it is suggested, has a special characteristic of retaining all beneficial changes and thus being able to very much more quickly develop complex forms. Modern scientists have looked at the sort of microevolutionary changes that we see around us and have investigated whether there is a limit to these variations and mutations, since this is the basis of macroevolution, which is essentially microevolution extended over very long periods of time. Many of them, especially those investigating this question in detail, have come to reject the most expansive claims made for macroevolution. Many of them are committed to evolution, but are simply describing what they have found. John Maynard Smith and E. Zathmeri say, There is no theoretical reason that would permit us to expect that evolutionary lines would increase in complexity with time. There is also no empirical evidence that this happens. Secret Scherer suggests that all living things belong to certain basic types, and he says, In the whole of experimentally accessible domain of microevolution, including research in artificial breeding and in species formation, all variations have certainly remained within the confines of basic types. And Pierre Grasse, an eminent biologist and president of the Académie Française, observed that fruit flies remained fruit flies in spite of the thousands of generations that have been observed and all the mutations that have been adduced in them. In fact, he says, the capacity for variation in the dual gene pool seems to run out quite early on in the process, and there appears to be a barrier beyond which selective breeding will not pass because of the onset of sterility or the exhaustion of genetic variability. Indeed, research on the E. coli bacteria over 30,000 generations of organisms have shown no real innovative changes and provided evidence for devolution, where the organisms gave up some of the structures without ever developing anything of a similar complexity. Biochemist Michael Behe 
has investigated the mutation within malaria, which has conferred it with resistance to the drug chloroquine. This requires the shift of two amino acids with a calculated odds of one in 100 billion billion. Tiny odds. But it did happen because there are so many malaria cells in so many infected people around the world. There are about a billion infected people and each one has about a trillion parasitic cells. But he estimates that because the population of humans is relatively small, it would take 1,000 billion years, hundreds of thousands of times the age of the universe, before even this small change was likely to arise by chance in the human body. And he points out that there are many features of the human body, and that life is bursting with such features, such that it is not possible to simply say that even this one beneficial change could occur, and certainly not even two or three. Mathematician Stanley Ulam has argued that it is improbable that the eye could evolve through numerous small mutational changes since the available time required exceeded that provided by the age of the universe. That evolution does not answer all the questions about the origin and development of life is supported by the paucity of the fossil record. Zoologist Mark Ridley says, the fossil record of evolutionary change within single evolutionary lineages is very poor. If evolution is true, species originate through changes of ancestral species. One might expect to be able to see this in the fossil record. In fact, it can rarely be seen. In 1859, Darwin could not cite a single example. Paleontologist David Raup points out that 120 years after Darwin, not much has changed. Ironically, he says, we have even fewer examples of evolutionary transition than we had in Darwin's time. Niles Eldridge of the American Museum of Natural History concludes, we paleontologists have said the history of life supports the story of gradual adaptive change, knowing all the while that it does not and Colin Patterson, a fellow of the Royal Society, says, I will lay it on the line. There is not one such ancestral or transitional fossil for which one could make a watertight argument. What this suggests to us is that there should be a great deal of caution when insisting that evolution, as a process for the development of advanced forms of life, indeed any forms of life, is proven to have taken place. Certainly we see microevolution at work in the differentiation of life within certain types. But even those scientists who have devoted their life to the study of the fossil record are unable to conclude that there is evidence for what many of them have adopted as a matter of faith, that the purely material process of natural selection accounts for what we see in the world around us. It would also seem that science itself allows us to conclude that even a belief in a form of evolution does not require atheism. There is no watertight evidence at all that macroevolution alone has produced the complexity we see in life. And this complexity seems to lead many notable sciences, scientists to consider that more than a material process has been required. Even if this material process is part of the design and part of the purposeful intention of a creating God. Science does not allow us to conclude that only evolution has produced what we see. Indeed, when we come to think about the very origins of life, evolution as a mechanism would seem to entirely fail. Anthony Flew, the atheistic philosopher, who came to accept that there must be a God, says, it has become inordinately difficult even to begin to think about constructing a naturalistic theory of the evolution of the first reproducing organism. And Stuart Kaufman, a theoretical biologist specialising in the origins of life, says, anyone who tells you that he or she knows how life started on the earth some 3.45 billion years ago is a fool or a knave, 
nobody knows. Those of us who are not scientists might well have the impression that in fact there was agreement about how life might have begun, but this could not be further from the truth. Nobel Prize winner Jacques Monod says, We have no idea what the structure of the primitive cell might have been. The simplest living system known to us, the bacterial cell, in its overall chemical plan is the same as all other living beings. It employs the same genetic code and the same mechanism of translation as do, for example, human cells. Thus, the simplest cells available to us for study have nothing primitive about them at all. No vestiges of a truly primitive structure are discernible. So there are, in fact, no examples of primitive life. There are simple forms of life, of course, but they are just as complex in their details as the human cells which make up our own bodies. The simplest forms of life have cells which work in the same way as our own and contain the same array of tiny biological machines. A living cell, for instance, might contain 100 million proteins of 20,000 different types and within the cell there is a constant activity of tiny structures producing and reproducing exactly the right proteins in exactly the right way. Biochemist Michael Bay has described the tiny motor that powers the flagellum, essentially the means of motion of the bacterial cell. 35,000 of these structures would be only one millimetre in length, and they contain 40 protein components which reproduce in biological form the structure of a motor. Behe has shown that if any one of these components were missing, then the entire structure would cease to work. It is irreducibly complex. Now Darwin stated that if any complex organ could be shown to exist which could not have been formed by numerous successive slight modification, then his theory would break down. But Behe has shown that there are countless such systems which demonstrate irreducible complexity. That is, if all the parts were not present together, then the whole system fails. Another biochemist, James Shapiro, also states that there are no detailed accounts for the evolution of any fundamental biochemical or cellular systems. These sort of facts lead Behe to conclude that the creation of life in its fundamental mechanisms and principles must have been dependent on some intelligent activity. And he does not accept, as a scientist, that the evidence points to simply the action of material processes over a long period. He says, Life on Earth, at its most fundamental level, in its most critical components, is the product of intelligent activity. What evidence do we have that simple processes alone could not have caused the beginning of life? Richard Dawkins states baldly that at some time in the past, a molecule happened to form by accident, which was able to create copies of itself. But Professor John Lennox describes how scientific research conducted over the 30 years since that statement makes this possibility increasingly unlikely. It had been thought that the atmosphere of the early Earth contained those gases which might perhaps allow for the spontaneous formation of the chemical basis of life, amino acids. But recent studies now conclude that the atmosphere was much different to that proposed in the 1950s when experiments were conducted, and that there was a much greater concentration of oxygen which would prevent these amino acids being formed, and would quickly degrade any that might exist. Nor is it only the problem of atmospheric chemistry. A very simple protein, which is part of the structure of every living organism, might have 100 amino acids. There are different types of amino acids, and the order in which amino acids join together in a long string will form a protein that determines the nature of that protein. Without becoming more complicated in our explanation than is necessary, the physicist Paul Davis has calculated 
that there would need to be a concentrated solution of amino acids the size of the whole universe to allow for the possibility of a simple protein being spontaneously created. It is such a tiny possibility, and this would account for only one small protein. And proteins are not life, they are merely the biological building blocks for life. Nor is there very much time for this impossibly small chance of even one protein being produced by chance to take place. Since the oldest rocks on Earth contain single-celled life forms as complex as those we know today. And these oldest rocks date from only a billion years after the formation of the Earth, according to the estimates of most scientists. Life as we know it contains hundreds of thousands of proteins, and it has been estimated that the odds against producing all of these proteins, with their amino acids in just the right order, from a selection of 20 different amino acids, is more than 10 to the power of 40,000 to 1. That is one chance in 10 with 40,000 zeros after it. Now even those atheistic scientists who are committed to an entirely material and chance origin of life agree that the chance origin and development of life is of such a small likelihood as to be impossible. This has caused some atheists to become convinced that the evidence points to an intelligence involved in the creation of life who can be called God. And we have heard statements from some of these scientists who now believe in a God, not because they have had a religious experience, but because the evidence of science demands it of them. But others believe that they can retain their faith in a purely material origin for life if they propose that the chemical systems which created the first building blocks of life, and then life itself, had some inherent structure and order, which predisposed them to create structure and order. We can reasonably ask with other scientists how this inherent structure and order came to be. It seems to be suggesting that the design we see in the living world is there because the design was built into the chemical processes, so that it produced order and structure as a matter of course. This surely only leads us to ask, why is there an intelligent design built into the world? And many scientists will be happy to state that it is because an intelligent and purposeful God has created the world, so that it is filled with evidence of his intelligence and purpose. Otherwise, we must say that it is by pure chance with an impossibly and infinitely small chance that there is an order in things that is not itself impossibly and infinitely unlikely. There is also a problem with this idea that there is a natural and physical self-organisation in life, because what is required is not the formation of a simple crystal pattern, for instance, but the transfer of information and of large amounts of information. Richard Dawkins himself agrees, saying, What lies at the heart of every living thing is not a fire, warm breath, nor a spark of life. It is information, words, instructions. Think of a billion discrete digital characters. If you want to understand life, think about digital technology. This information in living organisms is held in DNA the complex set of instructions in the heart of each cell which provides the instructions for the cell to be able to reproduce itself. In a human being the DNA comprises a database greater than the Encyclopaedia Britannica and found in every one of the 10 to 100 trillion cells in the body. The human genome or set of construction instructions can be represented as a code over 3.5 billion letters long. Different parts of this long code have instructions for building different proteins to maintain the development of the human body. We know that this genetic code is used in the forensic investigation of crime because it is unique to an individual, although parts of any one complete genetic code will also be shared by relatives. There are in fact more human proteins constructed in human cells than there are genes in the genetic code. 
Therefore, there is not a direct correlation between one gene and one protein. Something else is also at work to use varieties of genes and different states of genes to produce the even greater variety of proteins constructed by the information in the genome. The geneticist Stephen Jones uses this fact to point out that just because a chimp and a human share 98% of the same DNA does not mean that they are almost the same life form. In fact, they are very different. A chimp is a chimp and a human is a human. There is something else that uses the similar genetic code and produces such a great diversity of living beings. Nor does modern research into DNA allow much confidence that mutations take place at such a rate that macroevolution would be possible. James Shapiro says, it has been a surprise to learn how thoroughly cells protect themselves against precisely the kinds of accidental damage that according to conventional theory are the sources of evolutionary variability. By virtue of their proofreading and repair systems, living cells are not the passive victims of the random forces of chemistry and physics. They devote large resources to suppressing random genetic variation and have the capacity to set the level of the background localized mutability by adjusting the activity of their repair systems. This may all seem to be saying no more than that the information within the cell is also very complicated and not at all likely to be created in any random manner. This is indeed the case. But the problem is much greater than that for those who wish to insist on simple physical forces creating this complexity. If the DNA containing the genetic code in the cell is simply created by chemistry, then it cannot be the information processing system we know it is. But if it is an information processing system, then the code cannot simply be created by chemistry. We can imagine a computer in which every key press causes a predetermined letter to appear on the screen, unrelated to the keyboard. This would not be a computer in any sense. It would just be a fixed mechanism which produced certain letters on the screen. But if the key press actually responded to whatever letter was pressed, then it would certainly be on the way to being a computer. And the letters which appeared would not depend on the computer itself or how it was constructed, but would depend on some intelligent agent who was choosing which letters to press. If we imagine a book of random letters, it contains no information at all. But a book written in a particular language does carry meaning. The meaning is not found in the letters. They are still just black marks on a page, the same as the random letters. The difference is the introduction of the rules of language. But these cannot exist in the chemistry of the paper and ink. They exist in the intelligent mind that reads and writes. This is important because what is required in the living cell is both information and an information processing system. Simply having a randomly created genetic code impossible to even imagine taking place by chance, is not enough, since the cell must be able to reproduce this information. But it is even beyond imagining to consider that the reproductive process could also be created at the same time as the information, and also by chance. Indeed, information cannot, by definition, be random, and must be caused by a prior intelligent purpose, and act towards a target intelligent purpose. Now, if it could be shown that there were primitive organisms which used an increasingly primitive means of holding and duplicating information, and no such primitive means has been proposed, then there might be scope for considering the effects of evolution as the origins of life. But in fact, as has been mentioned previously, the very earliest and simplest organisms we are aware of all use the same highly complex means of storing and transmitting information which is found in our own human cells. If we do consider the scale of the odds, 
which would be required to create even a haemoglobin molecule by chance, then there is no possibility that chance could have accomplished what is required. If there were only 1,000 simplified steps to be randomly achieved, and if each step was either right or wrong, then this would still produce odds of 1 in 10 to the power of 300. That is 1 in 10 with 300 zeros. Now, atheists such as Dawkins are well aware that chance is no solution at all to the problem of the development of such complexity. And so he wishes to propose that each step should be taking place at the same time and be considered independently of all other steps. As if there were 1,000 people flipping a coin that could be heads or tails. Dawkins wants us to imagine that all the coins are flipped and then all of the results are checked against the target result of heads, for instance. And then only those who fail to get a heads throw again and then their results are also checked, and so on until everyone has thrown a heads. But there are a great many problems associated with this method. In the first place, it has nothing to do with Darwinian evolution. This requires that there be an operation of blind choice. But Dawkins is proposing that there should be a target against which all choices are measured. It is reasonable to insist that a checking mechanism requires an intelligent input, otherwise it is not able to check anything. And if a checking mechanism is required to check results, then this also requires that there be an intelligent target. Now how can blind physical processes be so clear-sighted as in fact to be working towards a goal, and also being able to compare results with an intelligent target at every step? They cannot. And if the processes which are taking place are performing this checking against a target process, then it must be concluded from purely scientific evidence that there is an intelligence and purpose behind all life. Otherwise, we are only left with the operation of random choice in the development of life, which even Dawkins admits is impossible. What have we considered in this short reflection? It seems to me that we have first of all come to see that science and faith in God are not incompatible and that there are a great many scientists who have a firm belief in the existence of an intelligent and purposeful God of some sort who is outside the universe which he created and formed. We've also seen that the operation of pure chance through macroevolution does not answer the most important questions of the existence of the universe and of the complexity of life, and that many scientists are dissatisfied with the simplistic resort to evolution when it seems that science cannot explain the basic questions. This is as much a matter of faith as faith in God. The very existence of the universe itself cannot be explained by science. If a prior state of existence or non-existence is proposed, then this also requires an explanation, which becomes more and more speculative. If there are trillions of universes, then this is also mere speculation, and does not eliminate the question as to where all of these trillions of universes came from. The fine-tuning that appears manifest in this universe so that stars, planets and even life on Earth can exist seem to be much too remote a chance to leave to random effects. It does seem to many scientists that the universe is especially suitable for our life on Earth and even tiny fluctuations in the basic forces of the cosmos or in the position and nature of our Earth would make life impossible. And then the very existence of life itself has been shown to be impossible for random effects to accomplish. The earliest life forms known to us are no less complex at the cellular level than our own human bodies, nor does the fossil record provide any firm evidence that gradual development of species from one to another has ever taken place. Indeed, research on rapidly reproducing bacteria suggests that there are limits to the genetic changes which are allowed in any life form, 
and that these limits prevent the development of one species from another. And as the study of life has uncovered the existence of DNA and the complex genetic code and replication machinery at the heart of every cell, it becomes even clearer that simple chance could never have produced such complexity. Not only because there is not enough time even in the lives of thousands of universes, but because what is being held and transmitted in the cell is information which cannot be self-produced, just as a book of random letters is not the same as a novel, because what is required is not just the production of letters on a page, but the prior existence of a language and a story to make sense of those letters and to be the basis of the formation of the letters on the page into words and meanings. Not even the impossible random action of various forces could produce the genetic language which must exist before the genetic code has any meaning. And this all leads many scientists, many of whom are certainly not Christians, to believe that there must be a creating, intelligent being outside the universe who has made the universe deliberately in the way it has and has provided the information that life requires to be able to develop and sustain itself. He has made the universe with the laws that scientists observe and in just such a way that there could be scientists alive who could observe the universe with wonder. The existence of God is not an excuse for ignorance. It is increasingly a response to the evidence which science is revealing. The universe, scientifically speaking, cannot be a random act of physical forces. Therefore, it is scientifically reasonable to conclude that an intelligent agent, God, has been involved in various ways in the creation of all that we see and discover. This is not absolute proof for God's existence, but it is certainly reasonable evidence for God's existence and makes best sense of the world that science is describing to us. Amen.